Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Rajal Pandya Loj, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Micronutrient Forum, and I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for today's event. Welcome to the ninth webinar in the second Global Summit on Food Fortification Virtual Series. This webinar focuses on mighty nutrients, the power of vitamins and minerals to unlock human potential. This webinar is also an official N4G Nutrition for Growth side event. The conversation today is co-convened by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN, by the Micronutrient Forum, by Harvest Plus, and by UNICEF. Before we begin, let me cover some key housekeeping points. First, there is simultaneous French interpretation for this webinar. You can simply click the translation icon in the control panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select your preferred language. Our interpreter is now also providing additional instructions in the chat function. Second, please post any questions in the Q&A function and I will do my best to direct them to our speakers during the Q&A sessions. And third, this webinar is being live streamed on the GAIN website and on the YouTube channel. We have a super event planned for you today with very interesting and very engaging speakers. In a nutshell, the webinar will feature opening and closing remarks surrounding two very ex exciting panel discussions. The opening remarks will be delivered by the Executive Director of the Micronutrient Forum, and the closing remarks will be delivered by a youth activist and leader. The first panel discussion will focus on scaling up solutions, and the second panel discussion will focus on country-level perspectives and experiences. We will allow time for Q&A with both panels at the end of each of their discussions as well as quick reflections from all the panelists on today's topic and their hopes for the future. Prior to closing the webinar, as I mentioned earlier, with remarks from a youth leader. We invite you to engage with all the speakers uh, and a team of experts from the four sponsoring organizations in the Q&A box. We will respond to as many of your questions as we can in the Q&A box. And we will also select some of your questions to ask our panelists during today's session. So do not be shy. Please post your questions. Please engage in the conversation. And please make it as meaningful as it can be for all of us to move forward this discourse on mighty nutrients. So without further ado, I would like to call on our first speaker. And this is Dr. Saskia Osendarp, the Executive Director of the Micronutrient Forum, to set the scene for us with an overview of the importance of micronutrients and to share some very interesting and exciting developments on the joint statement and the call for action on the power of micronutrients. Saskia, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Rajil. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's a real honor to be opening this session on micronutrients, those mighty nutrients that can really power our future. Can I have the slides, please? 
Can I have the, the first slide, the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, I think last week, uh, the, the Global Nutrition Report Edition 2021 was launched. Um, and this uh, report came with a sobering message that the world is not on track to meet the nutrition targets. The world actually was not on track before the COVID pandemic hit and COVID has made things worse. Uh, so some of these indicators, we've seen progress, but progress was not sufficient. And on many of the indicators, we have not seen progress. And we know that there is also a rising number of people, an estimated 3 billion, that cannot afford a healthy diet. And guess what? Healthy diets are rich in micronutrients. So an estimated 2 billion people worldwide suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. Um, and as I said, the COVID-19 has made things worse and have made nutritious foods even less available and affordable to millions more. So it is really, uh, this year of action on nutrition is really um, a good momentum and significant um, and very timely because it, we really need to reflect on the urgency now of actions that are needed and that can immediately scale up and become immediately effective so that we can turn this into a decade of progress on nutrition if we, um, and if we are to reach the 2030 goals. And micronutrient interventions are among these interventions that are immediately scalable and are highly cost-effective, as we will see later in this uh, session. And we know that a shortage of these micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, will have devastating lifelong consequences, including lower resistance against infectious diseases, but also against non-communicable diet-related chronic diseases, suboptimal growth, compromised cognitive development, and lower adult productivity levels. So without adequate micronutrient security, fewer people will live up to their full potential, and we may even be less well prepared for, to, for, to face continued challenges such as the COVID pandemic and possible future pandemics. So micronutrient interventions have been considered the best bet for nutrition and overall development because they are immediately scalable and they are highly cost-effective. In fact, um, interventions such as fortification and supplementation have been long hailed by economists uh, as being the world's best investments with an average return on investment of 35 US dollars for every dollar spent. Can I have the next slide, please? Now we know that there are no silver bullets in nutrition, and that also applies to micronutrient and malnutrition. So it's important to realize that we need an integrated approach from the soil to the fork and beyond across food and health systems. In addition to the promotion of healthy diets and breastfeeding, there are a host of proven micronutrient interventions, such as biofortification, supplementation, and fortification. And these interventions are particularly valuable in places where these dietary shifts are not immediately feasible or affordable or sustainable, or in stages of life, such as during pregnancy or early childhood, when we know that the nutrient requirements are very high and very difficult to meet with healthy diets alone. So these interventions are not competing with each other, they're complementary. And in fact, they are not competing with healthy diets. They are part of a healthy diet. Next slide, please. So why are we not really scaling up these interventions when we know that they are um, cost-effective and they can be scaled up, they're evidence-based, and they are maybe our only bet to accelerate progress towards the 2030 development agenda? Well, there are, of course, barriers and challenges that we will also hear about that must be addressed. These include the lack of policy prioritization and underinvestments. But we also need to learn how we can fully integrate micronutrient interventions in multi-sectoral approaches across food and health systems and economic social protection programs. We also may have some of these micronutrient interventions to become the victims of their own success. We know that vitamin A supplementation and salt iodization are among the biggest public health success stories in history. And they have significantly reduced the manifestation of goiter, iodine deficiency disorders, and vitamin A deficiency and associated night blindness. And this may have led to the false assumption that additional investments in these interventions may no longer be required. And third, last but not least, we lack data on micronutrients and micronutrient programs. 
preventing decision makers to effectively design and target these programs and monitor the progress of these programs. So the Micronutrient Forum, together with our partners at GAIN, Harvest Plus, the Iodine Global Network, and UNICEF have launched this call to action to really urge donors, governments, and private sector leaders to step up and commit new investments and new actions that rapidly scale up micronutrient interventions to accelerate progress towards this 2030 agenda. And I'm very pleased to announce that up to date, this, um, this call to action was further disseminated and signed already by 60 organizations in 30 countries. And we will urge you to also go, go to the website, the link will be provided in the chat and continue to sign this call to action when we, when we um, move up to the Nutrition for Growth Summit next week. And with this, I would like to hand over back to Baju and I wish you a very joyful session. Thank you. Saskia, thank you so much for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you for highlighting the importance of micronutrients, sharing the joint statement on the power of micronutrients, and congratulations already to have 60 organizations from 10 30 countries on board. And let's have many more join us. So I will hope that during the course of this conversation and afterwards, more and more organizations will sign on and add their voices to the power of micronutrients. We will come back to you, Saskia, later on for a conversation. But colleagues, let us now move to the first panel. This first panel focuses on scaling up solutions for improving micronutrient intake. And as Saskia mentioned, the urgency of actions that are required to scale up solutions. Uh, and the session will focus on that. We have three remarkable experts with us today who will share their knowledge uh, and insights with us. And I'd like to call on the, I will, I will pose a question to each one of them initially, and then we will come together in a moderated conversation where we will also take the questions from the audience. So please do submit your questions as we go along so we can pick on them during the session. Our first panelist is Dr. Victor Aguayo, who is the Director of Nutrition and Child Development at UNICEF. Victor, welcome to the session. And let me pose to you the following question. So we are hearing more and more about the triple burden of malnutrition. Can you tell us more about what that is, whether and why we should be concerned? And most importantly, how can we address that? Over to you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Saskia. Thank you, colleagues. It is truly my pleasure to be here with all of you today on this very important discussion about the power of mighty nutrients or micronutrients in the lead up to the Nutrition for Growth Summit next week. As uh, you know, and let me give you a little bit of background because I want to say a few words about the triple burden of malnutrition as I was asked, but I want for you to let, uh, I want to let you know where we are coming from. As we, uh, as you probably know, we started the year 2021 with a new nutrition strategy in UNICEF, a strategy that guides our nutrition program in towards 2030. And on this strategy, we first celebrate what we have achieved. And what we have achieved is quite remarkable. In the last two decades, collectively, we have been able to reduce the prevalence of child stunting by one third and the number of stunted children by 55 million. So this is a great achievement, a remarkable progress. It shows that positive change for nutrition not only is possible, but is happening at scale across countries and across regions. And Saskia was also referring to, to this in her opening remarks. However, we, are, we also need to acknowledge that there is a lot of work that still remains to be done. One in three children, as per our estimates, one in three children under five, and that is 200 million children in the world, is not growing well because of malnutrition. These children are either stunted or wasted or overweight or a combination of the above. So one, uh, 200 million children not growing well, and almost twice as many, uh, we estimate at least 340 million children suffering from micronutrient deficiencies. And I'm saying we estimate because as Saskia pointed, our data on micronutrient deficiencies uh, in children is suboptimal. So this is why we chose to speak about the triple burden of malnutrition. We want to highlight that there is a triple burden. All too often we speak about the double burden of malnutrition, undernutrition on the one hand and overweight and obesity on the other hand, but in between, 
and coexisting with both undernutrition and overweight and obesity, we have a huge burden of micronutrient deficiencies, which is why we choose to speak of this triple burden of malnutrition, which we in UNICEF believe is not only morally unacceptable, but also from a development point of view, unaffordable and unsustainable. On that, I would like to highlight a subset of the work that we feel is going to be crucial if we are to address this uh, triple burden of malnutrition, including the burden of micronutrient deficiencies, which is the very poor quality of children's diets in the first three years of life. If you follow the work of UNICEF, including our um, research and publications, just a few weeks back on the eve of the Food Systems Summit, we released a global report, uh, which we chose to uh, call Fed to Fail. Fed to Fail, which is the title of the report, shows that two in three young children are being deprived of the minimum, and I insist, the minimum diverse diet they need to survive, to grow, and to develop. Minimum diverse diets, are simply not available, not accessible, not affordable for two thirds of children in low and middle income countries, which are 90% of the children in the world. And we're also worried because with the exception of a few countries, globally we have seen no meaningful improvement in timeliness, in frequency, in diversity, or in the consumption of these nutrition foods, uh, nutritious foods. So I'm going to, to keep it at that for the time being, because I know that we're going to have questions about uh, solutions. And I would like to say a few words later on about how focusing and prioritizing improvements in the quality of children's diets in the first two years of life is one of the ways to go in the need to reset our priorities. Back to you. Excellent, Victor. Thank you for that succinct overview of the triple burden of under of malnutrition. And then exactly, we will come back and have a conversation further on how we can scale up actions to tackle these this important problem. Right. So let me move now to our second panelist. And she is uh, Dr. Lynette Neufeld, Director for Knowledge Leadership at GAIN. And Lynette, um, Saskia mentioned the importance of data. Victor has echoed that. And let me focus the question on you. Do we have the right, right data to understand and tackle micronutrient malnutrition? What needs to change about how we generate and use data to fight micronutrient malnutrition? Over to you. Thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this panel. So I think you uh, already heard the answer to this initial question alluded to by the previous two speakers. And to make a short answer, no, we do not have the right data to advance uh, work on micronutrient malnutrition. Effective actions to address micronutrient malnutrition should be designed based on up-to-date knowledge of the micronutrient status of the population and coverage and utilization of existing interventions. This is critical to assure that we are addressing real gaps in micronutrient intake that exist and to ensure the complementarity and non-duplicity of actions. I won't take time to show slides in this short intervention, but I'd like you to refer you to a recent publication by Dr. Ken Brown and colleagues in the, journal, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, published earlier this year. The authors produced a global map that quite strikingly illustrates the lack of micronutrient status data in low and middle income country populations, and even where data exist, much of that data is dated with surveys going back as far as the 1980s. Much has changed since that time and we cannot assume that status data generated at that time has any validity for the reality of, of populations on the ground today. For program coverage and utilization, there are some efforts to standardize appropriate indicators and some progress. For example, with the development of the Fortification Assessment Coverage Toolkit, which is a standardized approach to measuring fortification coverage and utilization that has been used in many countries now to generate data. But again, such data is critical at the design stage for interventions and also periodically through the course of implementation of interventions to identify and address implementation challenges. So in terms of what needs to change, I would like to focus on four things that need to be done better. Better prioritization of data needs, better data consolidation, collection, and curation, better translation and dissemination, and more effective data-informed decision-making. 
So a bit of a, a very briefly on each of those four points. For a prioritization of data, we love to collect data about everything. We think everything is important, but the reality is we only ever use a fraction of that data and we're not good at prioritizing what decision makers actually need to, to ensure that they can make the decisions they need. So we need to prioritize for decision making in the data we collect. Curation, consolidation, collection of data. I would refer you back to Dr. Brown's paper. Um, they did a wonderful job of highlighting all of the different things that are needed, the priorities to, to improve in that regard. Equally important is the translation and use of data. As researchers, we often assume that the findings from our studies are immediately uh, in, uh, usable as they are produced. But taking those findings from study results to actionable implementation, if, sorry, actionable implications for policy and program requires a very different skill set. It requires a profound knowledge of policy and programmatic processes and contextual knowledge so that the findings can be interpreted and, and, um, and brought to bear on policy and programmatic processes. That requires a very close dialogue from the outset of setting those priorities and, and, um, and deciding what data needs to be collected uh, that is done in collaboration, in dialogue among the researchers and the programmatic community. Um, if we can get those four steps right, we will have the data we need and we can design and improve programs for micronutrients based on data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynette, for those four very key and uh, very powerful points. We'll come back in the conversation on how we can actually move that forward and what else is needed in that whole ecosystem. Let me move to our third panelist, and that is Werner Schulting. He is the executive director of the Iodine Global Network. Um, Werner Saskia already mentioned one of the great successes is salt iodization, uh, one of the great uh, nutrition success stories of the past 30 years. What can we learn from this success story that can help us to address the malnutrition impacts of COVID-19 and climate change? Uh, what are the big learnings from this story? Over to you, Werner. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Rajul, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody from Ottawa in, uh, in Canada. Um, first of all, COVID-19 and the climate change continue to deteriorate micronutrient deficiencies, which were already extremely common across the world, but especially so, I would say, in Africa and Asia. So let me focus on three points. Number one, the fortification of salt has indeed been a huge success. Um, we think that there are more than 120 countries in the world where there is regulatory frameworks on uh, the ionization of salt. And we estimate that about 700 million cases of goiter have been prevented. In other words, if there would be no salt ionization, we would have at least 700 million people across the world with iodine deficiency uh, as shown by goiters. Um, in 2003, we estimated that there were about 67 countries which were iodine sufficient on average. And in 2008-20, that has gone up to 118 countries which were sufficient. So I think the success is indeed enormous. Second point, what are some of the lessons learned and some of the challenges we've seen? First of all, there are still about 20 countries which are insufficient in iodine. Um, on, on average. Uh, in Africa alone, we know that, uh, for example, in Burkina Faso, Burundi, Madagascar, Mali, Mozambique, South Sudan, there is still work to be done. So we need to keep up the push. Number two on this issue is that there is a need for a continued vigilance and a continued working and monitoring uh, of the, the programs. We know that in quite a number of countries, the coverage of iodized salt, as well as the iodine status, is deteriorating. And that can be because, for example, there is a lack of availability of good quality iodized salt. But in other cases, there are changes in food patterns, um, which lead to a decreased intake of iodine. 
Um, there are also issues of inequality, and this is an important factor in the lessons learned. We need to make sure that those populations who need micronutrients most are indeed reached by fortified foods. In the case of salt, we see, for example, frequently that poorer households use cheaper salt, which normally is not well iodized, and therefore they suffer from iodine deficiency. The third point is, so what to do now? Number one in this issue is that we need to increase the national ownership of these programs uh, in order to reach a more sustainable situation. Uh, we see that for salt iodization, a lot of effort was made to make programs work in countries, often with external resources. And when these external resources dry up, we see that there is no replacement uh, resources uh, from the national level, and that is a, an unsustainable situation. We need to improve our monitoring and data system. This was also raised by Lynette. Uh, we have an enormous gap in data, and I think that just continuing to expect that there will be more large-scale, nationally representative household surveys is probably not possible. And we will not be able to fill this data gap if we stick with traditional assessment methods and methodologies. Then we need to strengthen the national integrated food fortification regulation. So don't look at fortification programs, you know, vertically, looking at the fortification of salt differently from the fortification, for example, of cooking oil or wheat flour. And we need to strengthen the management programs. And there you have to link with data. Um, program managers need to have more information and knowledge, not only about the impact of their program, but they need to understand what are the main causes which make a program successful or less successful, specifically in reaching the poorer groups. So these are important things, and we need to think of a way to assess these causes of success or failure. If we have these things together, then we can continue to expand the enormous success of food fortification programs. Thank you very much, Lina. Yeah. Anna, thank you so much. And thank you particularly for those four last key points of what we need to do now. You'll come back to that in the conversation. So colleagues, I'd like to bring Saskia, Victor, Lynette, and Werner into this panel discussion now. Uh, and we are already getting some questions from our global audience around the world. Please keep those questions coming. But in the meantime, as we collect them, I would like to pose the first question to Saskia. And Saskia, this question is essentially as follows. You have shared with us the powerful complementary interventions that already exist that can improve the micronutrient intake of populations. Can you talk more about how we can unlock them and scale them up? And relatedly, what new ways do we need to work? What new stakeholders do we need to bring on board? And what do we need to do that we're not already doing? Over to you, Saskia. Brief response, please. Yes, thank you, Rajul. And, and I really want to build on the comments made, particularly also by Werner in this regard, that I think it's important that we stay responsive to the needs uh, of national level program decision makers and stakeholders in order to also make sure that um, interventions are being uh, tailored and to the specific context uh, on the ground and are serving a the specific needs on the ground. And I think um, in order for us to really step up, and, and I've talked about the need to integrate uh, these type of interventions more into existing food and health systems uh, and also social protection uh, programs. I think it is really important that we foster constructive dialogues and that we are um, bringing groups together and convene also groups that did not traditionally work together and that may even have disparate voices to really address these roadblocks that we, that we have seen uh, that are preventing a scale up and build some common ground driving this forward. And I think this year have seen some promising examples, particularly also when we were building up to the Food System Summit, where we saw that happening. And there was also an interesting question in the chat on the role of the private sector. And I think we will address that more later in this session as well, but that's definitely one example of an, uh, of an, um, uh, uh, of a group of uh, stakeholders that we really have to learn how to responsibly engage with when, uh, in order to move forward. So over to you. 
Thank you, Saskia. And you referred to a question coming in on the private sector. So I'd like to take that up from the audience. And Victor, I'd like to direct that to you. And the question is as follows. And then if others want to come in later on, I'll take that too. But Victor, let me direct the question initially to you. What is the role of the private sector in fighting malnutrition? And how can the private sector be incentivized and held accountable, uh, especially in all the efforts you're making towards the uh, actions? Over to you, Victor. Um, increasing the private sector is a complex sector. And sometimes when we say private sector, different people have different understandings. I think both uh, public and private sector are part of the food system, the health system and both public and private sectors need to contribute. So it is not public or private. When it comes to improving the quality of children's diets, which is core to the work that we're doing in UNICEF, the role of the private sector is paramount. Increasingly, the diets of children are dependent on a private sector that delivers diet services and practices that are aligned with children's right to nutrition and children's nutrition needs. So, um, do we need to engage with the private sector? I would say absolutely yes. Uh, do we need to engage with the public sector? I would say absolutely yes. And I think the first thing that we need to do is support and strengthen the capacity of the public sector and national governments to regulate um, the uh, parameters of uh, private sector actions and private sector interventions. When thinking about the quality of children's diet, which is very close to, to my heart and very close to the work and, and the advocacy that we want to do, as I was referring uh, before to this concept of being fed to fail, the fact that two in three children in the first two years of life simply do not have access to the minimum diverse diets they need to grow and develop to their full potential. Many of these children are counting on a food system that delivers those nutritious, safe, affordable, and sustainable diets. And many of those actions are in the hands of the private sector, including the food and beverage industry. So we do need a private sector that behaves in ways, that is, that delivers um, the, the policies, the products um, that children need to grow and develop to their full potential. So definitely, yes. But I would say our actions need to start with strengthening the capacity of governments to hold the private sector accountable and then supporting the capacity of the private sector to deliver what children need. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, let me direct the next question over to Lynette. And we're getting a number of questions from our global audience. So I will ask each of you to be as brief, to be as constructive and brief as possible so we can take more of them and uh, as we go along. So Lynette, this next question is directed to you. And it is, why should micronutrient deficiencies be singled out in a category of their own rather than being included as part of undernutrition? And can I tack on a second question also, picking up on your uh, intervention on data? What other technical or policy innovations do we need to be able to get to accompany the data innovations you're calling for? Um, you know, what do we need to change in that ecosystem for us to be able to tap into all the data revolution we need to, to be able to fight micronutrient? Because data does not exist on its own. So over to you. Why should micronutrient deficiencies be singled out? And what needs to accompany data innovations? OK, um, on the first one, um, it, the, the problem with grouping micronutrient deficiency with undernutrition is that it is not only people who are suffering from other forms of undernutrition who have micronutrient deficiencies. An individual can be overweight and obese and suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. And so it really is a category on its own in that regard. Yes, it is undernutrition, quote, in the sense that it is insufficiency that causes uh, micronutrient deficiency, but there's a risk of confusion there in, in equating with uh, it with other forms of undernutrition, whereas in reality, it can manifest, as I said, among individuals with overweight and obesity. On the second one, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but I am I understanding that to, to mean the actual using of data or, or is that, can I interpret it in that way? Yes, regard? interpret it that way. Okay. So the, the biggest challenge on use of data from my perspective is, is a better engagement from the outset of the people who need to be making decisions. We tend to work in isolation, those of us who generate data and those who should be using data. And there's a lot of challenges in overcoming the barriers. There's a time gap sometimes in how 
quickly a policymaker needs to make a decision and how long it may take to generate the kind of data or an evidence that we're looking for. And we need to find ways to advance that, such as, for example, better digital use, better use of digital technologies to collect data, better, better systematization and standardization of the metrics that we generate from data so that we can be quicker and more effect, uh, efficient in our, in our bringing that data to bear in policy processes. But we also have to understand that policymaking, there are many pressures on policymakers and it's not only data that is, uh, is an input into a policy and a programmatic process. So we need to understand how that data fits into the challenges and the pushes and pulls in a policy and a programmatic process. And in that translation step of data and evidence, well, I would say, take that back, in that prioritization of the needs for data, and then in the translation of that, make it real, make it relevant, and then make sure that that data is high quality. So you have that, you have the relevance and you have the excellence in the science and the data um, so that we can actually make meaningful changes that show better results in the end. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lynette. Um, Vern, I would like to direct the next question to you that's coming from our global audience. Uh, and this question is as follows. Supplementation programs often rely on donors. For example, some programs to provide vitamin A capsules to children have relied on donors for over 20 years. This is a precarious situation. How can we make efforts to fight mal malnutrition sustainable and country owned? And this reflects on the conversation, the point you had made earlier about national ownership. So over to you, Werner. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I think that there are many countries nowadays which do have uh, a budgetary post for the, uh, let's say, provision of micronutrients. There's definitely a shift uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, which has happened in that sense. Uh, but indeed, in many countries, uh, the availability of budget for specific micronutrient programs or for, uh, let's say, checking on imports or making resources available is indeed limited. And the difficulty you have in these countries is, of course, it's a zero sum game. In some countries, budgets are so tight that it is difficult to prioritize. And these decisions that there are difficult to make. I think in that sense, the only way out is indeed to make a, a very good assessment on the potential to have success and the potential to have impact and make different comparisons. In some cases, you need to make difficult choices. And in some other cases, you hope that there is a continued interest in the international community to support the programs which have proven to be impactful, which have proven to be relatively cheap, and which have been also proven to have not only an impact right now, but an impact which lasts throughout a lifetime. And in that sense, micronutrient programs, I think, tick all those boxes. Thank you. And you're also coming back when you talk of proven to the role of data and knowledge. To, to do that. So in a sense, we're circling back towards data also in some ways. Um, Saskia, let me direct the next question. To, and thank you, Werner. Saskia, let me direct the next question to you. Uh, and this question is, in India, some scientists are questioning the cutoff levels for anemia as given by WHO and state that these are overstating the prevalence of anemia. What are your views on this? Yes, and, and I think uh, um, that is a, that's a good question. And, and I think that's also a question that, is, uh, that needs to be urgently addressed. And I know that there's now work uh, by WHO and uh, UNICEF and other organizations, such as the ones involved here uh, on, this, uh, on this panel and the Micronutrients Forum, to work towards a new global action plan on anemia and an anemia alliance that can uh, include this question as well. So yes, we need to work towards what are appropriate cutoffs to define anemia and what does this mean for the in, in terms of the the numbers of people that are anemic and in terms of our ability to uh, to better target programs to those that are anemic and that will benefit also from different interventions in anemia we know that not all anemia is being caused by inadequate iron intakes so i think um, uh, that those type of data that's again brings us back to the importance of data uh, but I think the, um, there, there's promising developments now with this new global action plan on anemia um, and with the Anemia Alliance that really wants to make sure that this type of new data and new evidence is being translated into actions on the ground more effectively and more, more quickly. 
And in that regard, maybe on data, I also want to announce here that uh, the, the Micronutrient Forum will host a data alliance on micronutrient data uh, that will start in January with the aim to bring together stakeholders and work on um, basically filling this data gap uh, with, with various measures, uh, not only by uh, generating more primary data, but also by looking more effectively to other means of modeling impacts or modeling uh, um, proxy indicators uh, to assess what's happening on uh, with micronutrient data. So I, I think that's another promising development that we've seen coming directly from these summits that we've seen this year, the Food System Summit and the Nutrition for World Summit. Super, Saskia. I think all of us will keep an eye out for that uh, launch of the Data Alliance and uh, uh, how we can all uh, engage in that. Colleagues, I wish we could continue this conversation. It is really, really exciting, um, but I need to move us to the next one. Let me give you each 30 seconds. I know we will come back at the end. This is Scale Up Solutions. What's the solution you want to scale up? Saskia, which is your solution you'd like to scale up? 30 seconds and we do a quick round. Yeah, I'd like to scale up uh, micronutrient interventions during pregnancy because we know they are effective and we know that it's badly needed in order to prevent children to be born at the disadvantaged stage. Thank you. Victor, what would you want to scale up as fast as possible? It will come without surprise. I want to scale up improving the quality of children's diets in the first two years of life through actions both in the food system, in the health system, and in the social protection system for the poorest children. Lynette? To all of those programmatic interventions that others have mentioned, I would embed a data uh, platform that includes the implementers as well as key research partners so that there can be continual data for the continual improvement and eventual impact of those interventions. Thank you. Verna, you have the last word. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would need to say that, you know, the potential for large scale food fortification to have a huge impact on short term is uh, enormous. And um, I think that, uh, you know, that deserves uh, serious attention. And I think it needs to be seen as a kind of a social safety net, a social protection safety net, especially with the impact of COVID-19, which continues to haunt us and with indeed issues such as glo the global climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will come back to all the panelists at the end for a 30 second, your final message. But this session, I'd wanted to focus on what to scale up. Thank you so much to our speakers, Saskia, Lynette, Victor, and Werner. We'll come back to you later, but let me now move us to the second panel. And this second panel will focus on sharing country perspectives. Here we have four inspirational people who have been asked to share stories from their countries, their experiences, and to situate them within the broader context to the extent possible. As with the first panel, I will pose a question to each one of them and then engage in a brief moderated conversation together with your questions. Our first panelist is Ms. Juliana Auma. She is the founder of SHAC, the Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus Association in Kenya. Juliana, please begin by telling us why this is such a personal issue for you, and then how Kenya is tackling micronutrient deficiency in what you would like to see for Kenya to unlock the full potential of micronutrients. Over to you, Juliana. Yeah, thank you very much, Raju. Uh, good evening from Nairobi. And uh, this is a very personal issue to me because uh, 27 years ago, my life changed after I gave birth to my daughter Phoebe with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. At that time, the, mid the midwife told me that my child does not have a brain and her head is full of water and she will die because children born with those conditions don't live, but they die. So my child and I were locked up at the maternity hospital for one month. And when my daughter didn't die, I was told to go home with her and wait for her to die and then I can bury her. I got my daughter when I was very young. I was 19 years. Uh, I was a high school student. So of course I dropped out and became a mom to a child whose conditions I couldn't even pronounce then. Of course, I was a young woman who only ate to get full and not to be healthy. I also received my first dose of folic acid supplements when I was already four months pregnant. So this was too late. 
uh, after I gave birth, I realized that the stigma surrounding women with children who have birth defects is quite unbearable. The misconceptions around women who have children with birth defects kill the little hope that I had as a parent because I was blamed for my child's conditions, yet I was only getting to understand what she was going through and what was going on with her. Indeed, my life literally stopped for 10 years as I was also the sole breadwinner to my child and I was also a caregiver to my younger siblings since our mom passed on when I was only 14. By this time, Phoebe had already joined primary school. And as a person, I had started picking up the pieces of my life. So I went back to high school to get my certificate and probably proceed to college. So fast forward 27 years later, my Phoebe did not die. She is very much alive and is doing well. She is almost graduating from high school despite undergoing numerous surgical procedures. The cost of bringing up a child with spina bifida and hydrocephalus, especially in a developing country is so enormous. This is due to lack of access to the right information on the complex conditions and lack of access to specialized services for such conditions and also lack of early intervention. The greatest challenge is that spina bifida and hydrocephalus also come with other related conditions. These include poor bowel and bladder function, paralysis of lower limbs, recurrent skill answers, and spine deformities. All these need Juliana, we do not hear you. Oh, okay. Yes. Where, where do I start? Yeah, perfect. You just, yeah, you can please continue. Okay. Uh, all these happened to me simply because I had insufficient levels of a vital vitamin in my blood. Information on micronutrient deficiency is sadly not available and uh, not known by a large number of women of childbearing age. And this is why this discussion is very significant and very close to my heart. Indeed, it is a very expensive venture. So what is the government, how is the government tackling micronutrient deficiency? I understand that the government of Kenya has put in place some four strategies to prevent, control, and manage micronutrient deficiency. So these include dietary diversification, food fortification, micronutrient supplementation, and disease prevention measures such as parasitic infection control through deworming, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and health education. The government has also put in place food fortification strategy to facilitate increased production and consumption of fortified foods. But a lot still needs to be done, especially for us to reach those in our rural areas who are not privileged to have access to this information, yet they are more at risk. What would I like to see for Kenya to unlock the full potential of micronutrients? Yeah, for me, the government needs to shift focus on prevention of these neural tube defects and not on the care. The care costs a lifetime, while prevention can save the country so much. Kenya should make a deliberate effort in sensitizing consumers on the importance of regular consumption of fortified foods. Uh, the government should regulate the prices of fortified foods to make them not only readily ab available, but also affordable to all, especially those who are among the urban poor and those in the rural areas. The government should introduce lessons on micronutrient deficiency in the school curriculum from primary level to college 
to ensure that we continually engage in these discussions. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Juliana. Yes. I, I have two more points. Please. Okay, briefly, please. Yeah, the government should also ensure that all prenatal and antenatal clinics give out folic acid and iron supplementation to women of childbearing age regularly, and not only when they are already pregnant. The Ministry of Health should also work hand in hand with groups of special interest as a shark, since these groups make it evident that indeed micronutrient deficiency is a great matter to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you first for sharing your very moving story. And we're very happy to know that your daughter is just about getting ready to graduate from high school. That is inspirational. And mm -hmm. thank you for sharing also some of the uh, suggestions uh, that can be taken uh, up by the Kenyan government. We will come back to you in the conversation, but let me move to our second panelist, and that is Dr. Ferryu Lema. He is a senior nutrition advisor to the Minister in the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. And Ferry, I have a question for you is, how does Ethiopia's N4G commitment address micronutrient deficiencies, and what is the role of food fortification in Ethiopia's N4G commitment? Over to you, Ferryu. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I think in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian commitment we made at the N4G is to accelerate the implementation of food and nutrition strategy together with our uh, declaration, Sakota declaration expansion and scale up phases. And through this, I think the government committed to reduce or zero all forms of malnutrition by 2030 through effective implementation of uh, multi-sectoral nutrition-specific, nutrition-sensitive and infrastructure it's pathways. Uh, addressing micronutrient deficiencies is embedded within this commitment using three strategic uh, mechanisms, from quick or instant to complex as well as long-term actions. I think the first one is try to change what people eat, a uh, sort of a comprehensive action. And this has been, been only done through social behavior change communication, particularly targeting mothers or caretakers through various uh, approaches, cooking demonstrations and others. But this has uh, very little impact so far. And currently looking at it, it is not also linked with the diversified production and productivity, which is quite low in Ethiopia. So currently this new commitment is considering a social mobilization action uh, that goes through women empowerment and leadership, as well as youth engagement to work on diversified production productivity, as well as address the issue of various micronutrient deficiencies through change what people are eating during in their staples. And this is, yes, a long term but complex and multifaceted uh, action, and it needs, it will help us to transform sustainability, but as well as have a solution on availability, accessibility, affordability, and appeal of nutritious or foods that are the necessary micronutrients. The second strategy or mechanism is the supplementation, as it is said by many of us. And Ethiopia has been doing micronutrient supplementation through the health system. And this was mainly to uh, under five children, as well as mothers of pregnant and lactating women, uh, particularly with iron folic acid. And in the new commitment, you have changed these in the food and nutrition strategy as well. We have focused on currently working on folic acid and iron folic acid during conception, but also added or testing currently multiple macronutrient supplements for mothers. And that is a sort of implementation research that's being started now. And in the, our 10 year, will take it forward in terms of based on the findings. Also in under five children, we have vitamin A and zinc, but always the iodized salt throughout the life cycle. And also what is coming new is the micronutrient powder and iron syrups for where there is high iron deficiency in a specific area. And also there is high push to ensure large scale food fortification and well fortified production and consumption. And throughout the life cycle, we have this, and we have also started in adolescence, uh, we fast or weekly iron folic acid supplementation in schools and uh, as well as uh, health facilities. 
we have tested it and we are now expanding to more districts and regions throughout the country. I think overall, I think supplementation addresses our acute needs. However, as you know, and as it has been stated earlier, it needs resource. It needs quite resource, a big resource, as well as a good administrative, particularly logistic management systems. And it also needs to be addressed uh, at community level because supplementation needs uh, engagements. Individual families and communities need to be engaged, or it's usually six months or every three months is quite uh, very difficult. Uh, I'll come to food fortification if you have any questions later. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Ferry, for sharing with us uh, some of the key developments in uh, uh, Ethiopia's strategy. And yes, let's come back to food fortification in the next round. So let's move then from Africa to India to hear from our third panelist, and this is Dr. Uh, Arlapa. He is the Deputy Director of the National Institute of Nutrition in India. And Arlapa, India is investing in various initiatives to fight hidden hunger. Can you share with us a recent one that is particularly exciting or successful? Uh, and uh, if possible, share some lessons from that. Over to you, Arlapa. Thank you, Dr. Rajul Pandya. And again, giving me this opportunity to, to share Indian's perspective of hidden hunger and government initiatives to address these issues. The National Nutrition Monitoring Bureau has been carrying out periodic nutrition surveys since its inception in 1972 in rural, tribal, and urban areas, which revealed that a high prevalence of hidden hunger among Indian population, where the diets are poorly diversified with two. diets largely deficient in vitamin A, iron, folic acid, riboflavin, zinc, and calcium. Therefore, in order to fight against the hidden hunger, the government of India has launched several national supplementary nutrition programs over four decades ago to address this issue. They include vitamin A supplementation program to children six months to five years, and iron folic acid supplementation to at risk groups. They include children under five years, pregnant women and adolescent girls, and lactating mothers. Similarly, the supply of double fortified salt with iron and iodine. It has been carrying out supplementary nutrition programs through nation, uh, integrated child development scheme under which the beneficiaries of the under this program are children below six years, pregnant women and lactating mothers, where they receive the hard cooked meal every day. Similarly, there is a huge, huge midday meal program to school children, where they are meeting their one third of their calories and one third of the protein and other micronutrients. Similarly, government have in India is also providing rice, wheat flour pulses, oils, and iodized salt at subsidized rates to below poverty line families through public distribution system. In spite of all these interventions, supplementary interventions, there, has been, there, there is a continued nutrition problems of micronutrient deficiencies, which are become a major public health concern in India. Therefore, government of India has identified Fortification of staples as an important approach to complement the supplementary nutrition programs to fight against the hidden hunger and intended to supply fortified rice under various government schemes by the year 2024. In the same line, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India also intended to fortify staples with multiple micronutrients such as vitamin A, vitamin D, B12, B6, folate, iron, zinc, thiamine, niacin, and riboflavin. The government of India has introduced in 2019 that fortified rice will be supplemented through the public distribution system and a pilot board in 15 states. At the same time, as on a PPP mode, it's international NGOs, different state governments have successfully initiated the supplementation of midday meal using fortified rice with iron, 
which has resulted a significant reduction in the prevalence of anemia among school age children. Apart from these, these interventions, Government of India launched Ocean Abhiyan, that is National Nutrition Mission during 2018 to improve nutritional outcomes of children, adolescent girls, and pregnant women and lactating mothers. Along with India also launched the program Anemia Free India, that is Anemia Mukt Bharat, which, which aims at reduction of prevalence of anemia by 3% point per year by, by encouraging growing nutrition gardens where the fruits and vegetable plants are will grown to address the issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing with us that rich history and also the exciting current initiatives. Hopefully we can get back to them in the discussion. But let me come back then to Africa and specifically to Nigeria for our fourth panelist. And that is Dr. Razak Oyeleke, who is Deputy Director for Nutrition and Food Safety at the Ministry of Agriculture in Nigeria. Razak, the vast majority of Nigeria's farming families are smallholders who rely mostly on homegrown food production. So what is Nigeria and uh, its government and its partners doing to ensure that they have access to essential micronutrients? Over to you, Razak. Good evening from Nigeria. And I would like to extend the goodwill of my honorable Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Elijah Mohammed Abubakar. Uh, it is a pleasure and honor for me to be part of this uh, great event. Uh, in Nigeria, as you said, more than half of Nigerian uh, population reside in the rural area. And uh, in this circumstance, uh, the access to micronutrient can, is not taken for granted. It's not guaranteed, I mean. So the government of Nigeria to effectively address the problem of uh, uh, insufficient access to micronutrient is two-pronged approach. First is uh, industrial food fortification and dietary supplementation at the industrial level. And this is done mostly to address the food needs of uh, uh, urban dwellers that could access their food needs from the groceries and the supermarkets. But for the much larger segment of the population that reside in the rural area, the solution is the, in the second uh, approach of government, uh, that is a bow fortification. The program of bow fortification in Nigeria started in 2010, when the government decided to partner with the uh, AFEST Plus uh, to project research into uh, having micronutrient in the uh, crop we grow, staple crops we grow. And then we have in our focus growing uh, vitamin A maize, proof vitamin A cassava, and then uh, orange flesh sweet potato that we know it is, a, uh, it is having very high content of vitamin A. So, so far we, we have uh, about 2.5 million uh, farming families uh, that are into production of uh, about 45 crops. And this is helping the uh, Nigerian to address the, uh, the problem of lack of access to micronutrients because uh, the, uh, most of these people at the rural area, they grow their food to consume. And it is the little excess they uh, supply to the market. So uh, the government adopted the approach of uh, supplying the rural farmers with uh, planting materials of these uh, macronutrient crops. And so far, so good. Uh, uh, we have, as I said, about two and a half, half million farming family that are producing bio, uh, uh, bio 45 crops. 
And another good thing is that the bio fortified crops are not only nutritious. Because of the research intervention, these crops are also climate smart. Uh, smart. Because where we have the variety that are uh, that are, have very short uh, maturing and that are drought resistant, uh, that can uh, withstand flood. That is why it is good for us. Uh, not to make these uh, uh, biofortified crops only nutritious, but climate smart. And um, the government of Nigeria has integrated the endorsements of these uh, uh, biofortified uh, crops into several national policies in, in the sector of health and in the sector of agriculture. In the national policy of food and nutrition in Nigeria, biofortification is prominent. And in Nigeria, we have agricultural sector food security and nutrition strategy document. The document uh, places a great uh, priority on biofortification. And uh, we are partnering with uh, FS Plus to expand the availability of biofortified seed and ensure seed quality control. We also do uh, training of, uh, on how to produce and process biofortified crops. And you, it may interest you to know we are in the process of having national recipe on biofortified crops so that we not only grow uh, biofortified crops, we are able to prepare and this crop in such a way that you retain the nutrient and you make a good of the uh, micronutrient in this crop. Razak, I apologize to interrupt, but we have a very short time for discussion. May I, may I give you the last 10, 20 seconds to wrap up? Yes, thank you. And we do uh, uh, training on good agricultural practices so that the crop grown by the farmers, we have uh, the quality uh, uh, the, that is good for uh, the uh, for them to consume, and we also do nutrition education at all level, so that people Excellent. will know the essence of this uh, micronutrient in the food they consume. Uh, when I Thank mentioned you. the issue of uh, ionization of salt in Nigeria, it is taken for granted because uh, it, uh, the regulation is that any salt produced in any uh, factory must be uh, fortified with uh, iodine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think all of us are eagerly looking forward to that uh, recipe book uh, about cooking yes. with biofortified foods. Let me bring the whole panel together. Uh, and Juliana, Feriu, Arlapa and Razak. And colleagues, we're getting a number of questions in from our global audience, but we are also running out of time. So if I may ask you to be very brief in your responses and I'll try and take one question or two. And we'll go from there. Uh, Juliana, very quick question for you coming in, uh, where people, people are very excited and very humbled by your personal story and want to ask you, how might uh, uh, politicians and decision makers, uh, uh, what are your recommendations for how we can support parents like you as advocates to reach policymakers and decision makers to hear more from people like you? Quick one minute reflection. Yeah, thank you very much. To provide us with the platforms where we can be able to negotiate and engage directly with these policymakers and the politicians, I think that will be very excellent. We never have such opportunities, and it is important for them to hear from us, not to read about us from books. Thank you, Juliana. Global audience, hear her. Please, let's create. Um, yes. Let me come over to you, Feriu. Uh, a, a question for you is on um, uh, data. Uh, data challenges were highlighted in the first panel as a key obstacle. How do you think data systems for micronutrient malnutrition should be strengthened in your country? And if you want to finish your thoughts on food fortification, please do so, but briefly. Over to you, Feriu. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll touch the fortification in terms of uh, what we have as a mandatory fortification as many stated is out in within salt, salt uh, 
prioritization and that is mandatory, but we are currently have a standard and trying to work on it. We have one of the commitments we want also to submit is on the pipeline to for the N4G is mandatory fortification of large scale industries, particularly. And this was done through together with the sectors, but also the some business network that is working on that. In terms of data, we are developing a data system that's called UNIS, Unified Information System for Nutrition for, of Nutrition for Ethiopia, UNIS. And that is trying to catch particularly uh, all forms of the outcome as well as uh, indicators, but including micronutrient deficiencies, particularly at those vulnerable groups, particularly. Over. Thank you, Feryu. Arlapa, uh, we come over to you. And a similar question for you. How can data systems also be strengthened in your country uh, to tackle micronutrient malnutrition? Apart from fighting micronutrient deficiency through biofortification, general fortification, fortification of salt and iron, the government of India is also taking initiatives to strengthen the biofortification with the help of Indian Council of Agriculture Research as well as the ECRISAT to biofortification of various crops, particularly rice, wheat, pearl millet, and sweet potato with the different micronutrients, which will be the good answer to answer the, the persistent problem of micronutrient uh, malnutrition over a period of time in spite of all these measures. This biofortification will may take, will address the issue of this micro hidden hunger in India. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Razak, let me come over to you uh, with the question also of data, because that has resonated quite a bit. And then I'll come with an, another question for everyone. But how do you think data systems can be strengthened in Nigeria? Thank you. In Nigeria, we have National Bureau of Statistics. They have the custodians of uh, uh, conducting uh, surveys and generating data for all the sectors in Nigeria. And we know uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of challenges in this system, but from the relevant sectors that know the importance of uh, uh, data on nutrition and malnutrition, we are supporting the effort of the government uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, Ministry of uh, Finance uh, to uh, bring up what we call uh, food consumption and micronutrient survey. This survey we cover a lot and we give uh, the, the necessary data that is needed to uh, illustrate the condition we have in Nigeria with regards to uh, nutrition data. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pose the same question to all four of you. Uh, and this question is coming in on how is COVID impacting uh, micronutrient malnutrition uh, and the N4G commitments in your country. What is happening in terms, what is changing with COVID, you know, in terms of the work you do and in terms of the commitments moving forward? Let me begin with you, Juliana. What is, how is COVID doing? And each of you, please, very brief 30 to 45 seconds response. Over to you, Juliana. Well, our our involvement is quite minimal because we are a very young organization. So we are not at the, at, at the level of decision making in our country, but we can influence the process. Currently, COVID has really hit us very hard that uh, the focus has shifted from these special groups to the containment measures and also the need for people to get vaccinated. So issues of fortification are not being addressed as they should be addressed. So right now the country is focusing more on how to contain the measures, how to ensure infections are, are reduced and the number of Kenyans are vaccinated. So again, we really have to go back to the basics. Why are we here? We are here to advocate for fortification so that we can be able to solve this issue of micronutrient deficiency. So the civil society should not be overtaken by COVID, but we should continue to advocate and uh, create opportunities for dialogue, for them to remember that despite having COVID, we still have this other challenge of micronutrient deficiency as a country and also as a community in the world. 
Thank you, Juliana. Thank you. Ferry, over to you. I think COVID at the beginning had a, an issue of access and uh, reach, but we, we included nutrition within uh, essential health service through uh, continuous support when the COVID uh, started, and that addressed some, but there was always issue of commodity supplies because of getting in globally from various countries was not easy. Over. Thank you. Arlapa, over to you. COVID has adversely impacted the nutrition status of children, particularly children below two, three, five years, because they are used to get the six months to the three year children used to get take home ration for the supplementary fee under supplementary feed program. Whereas three to six year children used to get hard cooked meal at a center. Because of this COVID, this was a lockdown, we could not supplement these programs. That's why they, they have uh, not benefited from this program. That's why they are prone to more undernutrition. This has impacted more even those suffering from severe acute malnutrition, where the nutrition rehabilitation centers have closed because of this one, as well as children's school going where they, they lost their midday meal because of closure of school. Thus, it has a severe impact on notice status of children, particularly in Indian children. Thank you, Arlapa, for sharing that. And Razak, over to you. Thank you. Uh, COVID-19 has hit the whole world below the belt. And in Nigeria and in Africa, where the poverty level is so high, people tend to hit what comes their way. So the nutrition uh, uh, situation becomes uh, jeopardized by COVID-19. So in response to that one, uh, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture is on preventive side, uh, promoting the, giving the uh, planting material of bio fortified crops to farmers so that they grow and heat to have access to uh, macronutrients. At the Federal Ministry of Health, uh, the, they are into uh, uh, fortification of food. So the, uh, the food intervention of government uh, is making sure that uh, uh, the food being uh, given to the people as a uh, form of assistance to them are uh, fortified. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I would love to continue this conversation and hear more about your stories, what motivates you, what drives you, and what, what we can do to tackle this important challenge. But we are out of time. So what I'd like to do is bring all the panelists together and give you a chance to give your 30 second final message uh, that you'd like to, any, any, anything you'd like to reiterate, anything new you'd like to bring to people's attention. All the panelists, and I will begin in the reverse order, 30 seconds each to Razak and the last speaker will be Saskia. And then we will come to our hearing the closing reflections from our youth leader. So Razak, your 30 second final message. Thank you, uh, Michael Newton. The vision is not only to the poor, it belongs, it is uh, being suffered by all segments of the population uh, to hidden hunger. So the education was focused on not only the poor, but entire population to know that uh, micronutrient uh, deficiency may affect both the rich and the poor. Thank you. Thank you. Arlapa? Over the 45 years, the Indian diets have not changed at an optimal level, where the micronutrient model continues to be a major public health concern. Therefore, till we, our the Indian population, meet their micronutrients optimally through their dietary diversity, the supplementary programs, as well as uh, fortification of bio fortification of major micronutrients should be continued. Otherwise, the hidden anger continues to be a persistent problem. It has a huge impact on Indian economy and health of out-of-pocket expenditure of Indian families. Thank you, Arlapa. Ferry, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think we need to come together to address the issue of the mighty nutrients and learn from all our colleagues who have been here today, as well as in the audience. And we'd like to learn how to address this issue, particularly in terms of food fortification when there is a big country with very difficult access as well as various traditions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Juliana? Yeah, thank you very much. I believe that micronutrient deficiency should be a wake-up call to most of our governments. The impact is very enormous. And when we have 
policies in place and they are not being implemented, then that is something that is not quite in order. It is important to have these policies and work towards implementation so that we can see a change moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. I will call now on Werner. Yes, thank you. I would like to call upon all countries to take a close look and critically analyze the situation of food fortification programs in your country. Don't assume that all is well and that your programs have been running for a long time, but explore what needs to be improved and how you can expand the reach of the programs, especially paying attention to the poorest population groups in your country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Werner. Uh, Lynette? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think we've heard that we have the solutions we need through dietary changes and, and many complementary interventions uh, through the food system, the health system and agriculture systems to address the problem. Um, with some colleagues, we'll soon be publishing a paper that will provide a re-estimate of the global burden of micronutrient deficiencies, particularly focusing on women and children. And I really hope that we can use that as a, as a spark to take this problem away from its hidden, quote, hidden hunger nature into the spotlight and to generate the evidence and the resources and the impetus we need to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Victor, over to you. Thank you. Um, Saskia, Lynette, Werner, and others have referred to the need for a data revolution when it comes for, to micronutrients. I propose that we need a communications revolution as well. We need to reimagine the narrative around the centrality of micronutrients for survival, growth, development, learning, productivity, and for the participation of children, adolescents, and women. Why would, this is my question, why would a prime minister worry about something that is micro? if she can focus on something that is mighty. So let's communicate better about micronutrients as mighty. And I think this communication revolution is something that I would like to work on with Saskia, with Lynette, with Werner, with all the colleagues around the table and those participating today with us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Victor. Saskia, your reflections? Yes, thank you. This has been such an excellent uh, session and with so many excellent contributions. And I think particularly the personal testimonial of Juliana really reminded us that, you know, these 3 billion or maybe, you know, there will be a new estimate, but billions of people that are estimated to be micronutrient deficient. And these two out of three children that cannot afford even a minimum acceptable diet, these are not just statistics. These are real people whose lives are being impacted uh, for, for a long time. Uh, and whose futures are being affected for a long time. And I think it's important to realize that no mother should really have to worry about the futures of their children. And we have an opportunity now to make that change. And yes, Victor, we need to continue to advocate and build that story better. We need to also make sure that we have better data on everything. And we're really committed to drive this micronutrients agenda forward. And I really urge everyone now to, to go to this call to action. And if you've not done it yet, to, uh, to just sign it so that we urge also the leaders that come together next week at the Nutrition for Growth Summit to do the same. So thank you very much uh, every, to everyone for this uh, excellent session. Thank you, Saskia. Thank you to all of the panelists for remarkable interventions and really just thought-provoking and energizing. Uh, for our closing remarks, let me call on our uh, last speaker, and this is Maureen Muketha, youth leader for at um, Act for Food, Act for Change. And Maureen, we are looking forward to your remarks. This has been an inspirational panel. I'm sure you will agree with me that we've heard really, really exciting ideas and we look forward to your closing reflections. Over to you, Maureen. Thank you, Rajul, and um, it's a pleasure. I must first start say, by saying um, I greatly appreciate um, the young people being involved in this conversation, and I have been listening all through since we began, and I must say this have been really insightful and um, uh, inspiring conversations, and as a young person, I can only try and imagine I'm already seeing the future as being very bright because um, micronutrients, uh, just as we have been told right now that uh, them being referred to as micronutrients um, could be the messaging is what is wrong. But I also wanted to say that um, 
these micronutrients or why they cause hidden hunger is because the clinical manifestation is mostly uh, visible when the symptoms or the deficiency is long pre prolonged. Um, I really, um, I was really moved by Juliana's story because that is a classic example of um, um, it, lack of adequate uh, um, consumption of the ad of adequate nutrients now for like in this case uh, iron which is actually a major pub uh, a nutrient of uh, public health concern and um, uh, Juliana's example was just one of what many young people um, or, may, or one of what the population is going through we have um, iron deficiency, which is a public health concern. We have vitamin A deficiency, which um, is also a very big uh, micronutrient concern, concern mainly among children because it causes blindness. And you can only, you can imagine what, when a child or a young person loses their sight when they're still very young. Um, mostly uh, like in developing countries, we are still yet to uh, have developed infrastructure of how this young person, this person's life can still be enhanced or they can be able to lead a quality health, uh, a quality life even beyond losing their sight. So I, I really concur that micronutrients, these are mighty, uh, they are mighty nutrients. They may be required, they are required in our body, in our bodies in very minimal amounts, but the lack of these nutrients really leads to, um, uh, very serious health repercussions, and even for um, the pregnant and for pre the pregnant women, um, it also leads to poor birth outcomes. Um, so we have had a lot of vitamin, a lot of iron, a lot of uh, conversations around iron. We have had conversations around vitamin A, but I also wanted to mention things like iodine. Um, which is found in salt uh, fortification or salt iodization, which salt is the vehicle that is used to um, fortify uh, iodine. But we also have um, micronutrients such as um, zinc, um, which are also a nutrient of public health concern. But um, so as a young person uh, who is part of the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign, um, these conversations really resonate with me because part of the things that the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign, which is actually a campaign that was launched on the 18th of, uh, of May, just um, during the uh, as a lead up to the UN Food System Summit is this is a campaign that calls that brings together young people from all over the world, the different parts of the world to um, one take action in their own capacity, whether own capacity does not necessarily mean um, have projects uh, at global level, but also at your local level from where you sit, what can you as a young person do uh, and in your own capacity, what you can do in your own capacity, but also we have the actions for change, which are a list of um, uh, which are a list of actions that we call that that were identified by different by the young people um, uh, to call young to call businesses to call uh, government leaders uh, those in decision making at the decision making table to uh, create uh, or yeah create an enabling environment for young people or all people in the uh, the general population to have access to safe and nutritious food. And what really makes me smile is um, part one of the actions for change that um, young people are really uh, resonating with and are really advocating for um, in their different countries is young people need to have access to safe and nutritious foods at all times. Um, and also the other action for change is young people, uh, both at the school, both at um, at school level, university, at nursery need, need to have also access to the safe and nutritious foods. So how I see this being a, a synergistic, uh, being an area where Act for Food, Act for Change, and also uh, business leaders and government leaders and those um, who sit at the decision making table is um, how, how, what are we doing or what um, is your organization doing to ensure that young people have access to this safe and nutritious food? And one low lying fruit um, that I see is uh, like the school feeding meals uh, or the school feeding programs that um, I implemented. Um, this is one way in which we can be able to even promote uh, things like the biofortified uh, um, the biofortified crops, such as like the orange, uh, orange fleshed sweet potato, we have the high iron beans. And once a young person um, 
is uh, gets accustomed to consuming these foods uh, right from the, the from the onset when they are very young up to when they grow old this this consumption of nutritious foods becomes embedded in them so this means even as they grow up as uh, as they work towards leading productive lives one they are eating they know what these nutritious foods are. And um, remember, it could be, an, it, even as the food, um, you could be consuming food that uh, is not dense in nutrients, but if you consume like the biofortified foods, if, you're, if young people are able to identify what these fortified foods are, because there's also a lot of um, lack of adequate information about what fortification is all about. Fortification is not, uh, I know this could open a can of, a can of worms, but fortification is not a uh, GMO. Uh, fortification is basically adding the, the essential nutrients, now like uh, vitamin A, like iodine, um, into food so as to in, um, improve its nutritious uh, or its nutrient profile. So once young people are able to identify um, uh, these foods that are fortified, also a simple way would also be identification of the fortification logo. I'll give like a, an example, like in Kenya, we have the fortification logo, which uh, you can, once you know the fortification logo, a food, a food has a fortification logo, it means that food has been fortified. So those are some of the ways in which young people can um, take part in. But I also want to commend um, uh, various governments and now speaking from where I come from, uh, the Kenyan government, we, it has, it, it runs projects such as um, the anti, uh, deworming drives, uh, which are part of the Malaysia Bora and deworming drives uh, enable young people. Uh, this, uh, this, is a, this is a campaign that um, uh, um, distributes intestinal worms or to young children um, because the intestinal worms uh, lead to a competition, uh, more so iron, and uh, they, they predispose young people to uh, iron deficiency. Um, so those are some of the campaigns that the government is running. But also very recently uh, in June, we had the fortification summit, uh, which was um, held in Kenya, that we saw um, the various steps that the government is doing, in, including um, working with, uh, including um, uh, share uh, the frequent surveillance that is done uh, to ensure that the foods that are in the market are adequate, adequately fortified and also capacity building among consumers. Uh, this could be uh, like through um, radio or media advertisements to ensure that these fortified foods uh, are well known to um, the population. So as I close, Rajul, uh, what I would say is as, um, as a decade of action, um, micronutrients are a very key part or a very key component for young people to be able to lead healthy and productive lives. Um, so let us ensure from wherever, whatever point we see it, that um, this we are making, we are ensuring that young people have access to these foods and also like for the private sector, um, uh, they are able to come up with new and innovative ideas such that uh, young people, they, they manufacture foods that are desirable to young people, um, healthy and fortified foods. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for this inspirational remarks. And thank you for the bringing the voice of the young people in the discourse, not just as recipients, but as active uh, demanders of change and of active agents for change. And that is very inspirational to all of us. Colleagues, we are coming towards the end of the session. I will not dare to summarize anything because we have had such an extraordinarily rich set of interventions, set of ideas presented, set of challenges, set of actions we can take, we can scale up, uh, and so forth. I encourage all of you, if you missed any portion of this event, go back and listen to our speakers. They were so succinct and so inspirational in what they presented. Ideas for the data revolution, the communications revolution, finding platforms for key players to engage in, finding ways to transform the space in which we are uh, fighting micronutrient malnutrition and what we can do. I will not dare to summarize it. Listen to this set of speakers again. 
I will reiterate, however, what Saskia had said several times to ask all organizations who are present here today and those of you who are watching this video in the days and weeks to come, including the national governments, the bilateral and the multilateral partners, civil society, private sector organizations, as well as importantly, as well as individuals to join the global call to action. And this call is important as we head to the N4G Summit next week. Please join and make your commitment. Today's webinar was the ninth and the final in the series of conversations on food fortification leading up to the UN Food System Summit in September and the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit next week. Please join the conversation on the GAIN website and on the Future Fortified social media channels on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. You can find more information on the series at the link that we will put into the chat function. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers today. They inspired us, they motivated us, they educated us, and really they, they, they shared with us very insightful remarks. Thank you to you, the audience who is joining us at different times of the day from around the world for your commitment to tackling micronutrient malnutrition and for your energy and for your inspiration. We look forward to having you join us again in 2022. Please make your voice heard. Please sign the global call to action. Thank you very much, everyone, for a wonderful section together and the conversation with you. Thank you.